Hi everyone, my name is Cole and uh, welcome to the gallery for what is actually our final night to take a video of these three pieces while they are still here together in chronological order. Now, welcome back to the channel or welcome to the channel, which of course sheds some light on the mysterious subject of furniture from the past and which I hope will help you understand what types of it are valuable and why. As you'll see, I tend to treat mainly the subject of period furniture, which is pre-industrial, predating the year 1840. And what I want you to take a look at here with these three commodes, these three 18th century pieces, on average about 260 years old a piece, I want you to take a look at how they afford us the ability to see the evolution of style across the 18th century. And uh, these certainly protect the pieces from the sun, but other than that, they're not very helpful. So we begin in the 1740s with a commode that is abundant and curvilinear, and then we end up here in the 1780s with, with something that's quite a bit more orderly, restrained, and neoclassical. But before we get into the joinery and the details of every one of these little pieces, I think that most Americans, or certainly enough English speakers, would like to know what exactly a commode is. Now, this is a word or a name that was given to these pieces because in French it means handy. So in the late 17th century, when the first commode was invented, it was a piece of really palatial caliber, which was intended for a place like Versailles. Uh, you know, they didn't know what to call it. It was a decorative side table, but you know what? It was handy, it was useful, because it had been fitted with drawers. So although these pieces are from the following century, the 18th century, and they are not of a royal caliber, it's important to apprehend them with the original context of what these pieces were as works of decorative art in mind, such that we can differentiate them from today's bedroom chest of drawers. In fact, during the 18th century, owning one of these was a very expensive affair, much as it is today to own an 18th century chest of drawers. Uh, but that helps us to see these not as something which would have been relegated to a dark bedroom, but rather a handy side table with these curious drawers that was meant for the middle of a large reception room up against the wall, in any case, in a very visible part of the house. In fact, the most notorious dealer in French history, whose name we will not mention because he got caught being a crook, said that there is a specific type of client in the art market who enters the art market once in their lives, and this is at least true in France, to purchase something of significance to be left to their children. And this man observed that 99 times out of 100 for clients such as this, the item purchased is a commode. So although the name might not necessarily resonate in American parlance with regard to furniture from the past, in fact, commode might conjure up a totally different thing than, say, a decorative side table from the 18th century. In the French-speaking world, um, and certainly in the history of the decorative arts world, the commode is a really quintessential piece of furniture from the past. And here today, we have this unique opportunity to look at three models which are each exemplary of different very important movements in the history of art during the 18th century. So right away in the beginning we see that this is a three-dimensional representation of the mindset of the era. There's something witty, there's something unpredictable about it. Um, there is an element of the design here that seems to have been left to chance. It's not quite as orderly as the other two which become progressively more orderly as we go through the century. This style is named after the monarch whose reign loosely corresponded to the duration of this style, Louis XV. But it is also known as rocaille or French rococo, which is a term that means rocky or uneven ground. And when we take a look at this commode, we can really see how the main tenets of its aesthetic are something uneven, asymmetrical, movement-driven, evoking nature. It is in fact anti-classical, Whereas the other two commodes derive their, their design, their, their decorative value from the decorative repertoire of the ancient republics, from classicism. They are neoclassical, then new reinterpretations of ancient classicism. And this is in fact anti-classical, meaning that the entirety of its decor and design is devoid of the influence of the ancient republics. So for that reason, the French Rococo, whether or not you like it, 
can at least intellectually be appreciated by most people as kind of an outstanding moment in the history of furniture. But right away, we can see that there's a very complicated serpentine frame here, which would have been made by a master furniture maker. Of course, if you glue boards together, you'll get a straight line. But if you file those boards to a wedge and then connect them together, you'll have a curve. So there's a very intricate frame here, which is actually protected by these shoots of gilded bronze. But talking about the frame, the bronzes, the veneers, and the marble brings up the subject of how each one of these pieces is technically a work of veneer art, or in French, a meuble d'ebenisterie, which was created by a collaboration of different artists who were, of course, all working at the speed of the world then, which was no faster than a horse. So that's something remarkable to think about, that there was one separate artisan who crafted this elaborate frame out of the materials of nature with his bare hands, and then there was another artisan who used exotic veneers which themselves had been harvested across the world and boated across the ocean uh, to France, and then he applied those veneers in these elegant chevron patterns all over the frame. And then finally, there would have been the bronze casters and gilders who would have created these molds, poured the bronzes, and then chiseled them and filed them to make them look as attractive as they do. And then they would have gilded the bronzes with the mercury gilding method, which was abolished about 80 years after this was made. I suppose we shouldn't mention the difficulties of getting a piece of marble out of a quarry in the 18th century and polishing it to look like this. Now the marbles, in fact, on all three of these, and in period furniture such as this in general, the marbles would have been coordinated to match the color of the marble of a fireplace. Now, moving on here into the 1760s, we notice that the body of this commode has become, well, quite blocky, straight-sided, yet the feet have remained curved. The side posts have been angled. They're no longer curved as they are here. And the decor of the piece has become entirely neoclassical, namely with these Greek friezes, or I suppose Greek borders, that frame the fronts of the drawers as well as the sides of the piece. And then the bronze ornamentation, which you'll see across the front, has become neoclassical as well. We have wreaths of laurel as drawer pulls. The feet are adorned with acanthus leaves, as well as this here, an acanthus leaf and a Roman perfume burner. And so then finally we have these sort of Greco-Roman architectural console motifs that uh, fall down the sides of the piece. So what could have possibly happened prior to the execution of this piece, which would have sparked such an abrupt change of pace? Well, this style is called the Greek style. It is, it is said in French to be le, le goût grec, in the Greek taste, because here in the 1760s, we're deeply under the influence of the stylistic change that was sparked by the excavations of the city of Pompeii in 1748. So by the early 1750s, the trend-setting people, the people who had the money and the homes for this type of furniture, they were aware of the excavations in Pompeii, and they were interested in changing their aesthetic. There was also a group of artists who really undertook a certain mission to shift the arts away from the excesses that the Rococo style had sort of devolved into at that time. But fundamentally, we see that this transitional commode, which moves from purely curvilinear Rococo to purely rectilinear neoclassicism, we can see that this transitional commode is the result of a change in the tenor of the times whereby people are now interested in classicism. So this transitional style didn't really last very long. In fact, it's one of the rarer styles in French history. And some of it is a little lopsided and clumsy. Luckily here, as with all of these commodes that we have today, um, we have a particularly harmonious example of each style. And this style is one where we're quite lucky to have such a nice example because it is a difficult style to achieve, being effectively the blending of two styles which are polar opposites. So here by the 1780s, we've moved purely into a style which is French neoclassicism named after Louis XVI. It is rectilinear, it is understated, it is elegant, and it does derive much of its decor 
from the forms of ancient Rome. But unlike later chapters in the evolution of European neoclassicism, the Louis XVI style here is applauded for being neoclassical, but sort of whimsically so, as if it really didn't matter. The empire style which follows tends to be neoclassical in a very rigorous academic monolithic sense, um, where the French were recreating sort of this fantasy world of interiors of ancient Rome with academic precision. But here, the neoclassicism of the Louis XVI style is quite a bit more playful than the later chapters in European neoclassicism. And this is really what it is prized for today. Because although it is totally straight-sided, we see the side posts here are rounded, they are not harsh angles, and they are fluted, uh, simulating the flutings in, the, in an ancient Roman column, for instance. And the bronze ornamentation on this particular Louis XVI commode, although there are plenty of finer Louis XVI pieces which are covered in really elaborate gilded bronzes, these ones are a little subdued so that the artistic value of the piece is really coming uniquely from the contrast between this Carrara white marble and the red mahogany exterior. This particular commode might be interesting in terms of American history simply because it is equivalent in period and in style to the furniture that Thomas Jefferson brought back to Monticello. There is a commode in American history, which is currently in the James Monroe Museum, which was brought back by President James Monroe after his ambassadorship in France in 1794 to 1796. Now, the commode that Monroe brought back is very similar to this one in form and in design. However, it is slightly later than this piece, and it has been adorned with all sorts of brass fillets and brass ornamentation, which was the style of the decade after this. So, I want you to be able to take a look at these pieces, not only for the sort of tedious art history exercise that it is, to see what period furniture allows us to see, which is the three-dimensional representation of the mindset of each era. But I also want you to see these because even though these are not really fit for a national museum, these are certainly publication quality, uh, quintessential examples of French commode tables. And so the best way to learn how to be a better collector, how to buy good pieces from the past, is to see good pieces from the past and understand what some of their qualities are. And so one of the final things that I would like to do with you all is to just run along the back of these commodes to check them out so that you can see that these marbles are left unfinished in the back. They were clearly sought out by hand. Uh, they would not be polished on the back. And then the backs themselves, like the backs of the marble, the backs look quite a bit more rudimentary than you would expect for such fine pieces. But the reasoning behind that is that here in the 18th century, it was so hard to finish these elaborate and beautiful exteriors by hand that they really wouldn't go to very much trouble to polish up the backs. So they're often left rough, and we can see obvious traces of sort of clumsy hand saw marks. And then finally, because we're 270 years in the future, the backs of the pieces are quite oxidized. This one, in fact, has the remnants of some chalk marks left by the original maker that I find quite charming. I have no idea what they say. Sort of illegible now. But a lot of the times, the markings left on the piece, if it wasn't a specific signature, the markings would simply be the inventory system of the maker so that he could keep track of the 50 different pieces of this piece while they were all coming together. In fact, if we move this marble, this is one of the first things that you do. You can see how the frame was dovetailed together and secured by a few rudimentary hand-forged nails. This is one of the first things that you do when trying to apprehend whether or not the commode you're looking at is really an egregious copy or a period piece. Now, the trouble arises when you're trying to differentiate between a fake and a period piece. But more often than not, I have encountered people who have 19th century copies of these 18th century pieces, and had they known a few of these simple criteria or checklists, they would have been able to very rapidly ascertain during their purchase that the commode they were buying was, for instance, a Louis XV commode. Well, is it a Louis XV period commode from the 1740s, or is it some sort of late Victorian machine-made thing from some factory 
uh, circa 1900, you know. And so the name of the game in dealing is changing, but that was something that I'm afraid many people who purchased in the 80s and 90s were unaware of. Well, everybody, I thank you very much for your time, and I hope you've enjoyed taking a closer look at these three pretty remarkable pieces of furniture from the 18th century. I don't know when the next time is going to be that I'm going to have three equivalent pieces lined up in chronological order, but that's part of why I wanted to make this video, so that we could not only experience this three-dimensional evolution of style, but also, as usual, to preserve a digital trace of these period pieces during their short time with me, and in a way to help you learn as much as I can about what makes certain furniture from the past valuable and what makes certain furniture from the past perhaps better suited to staying in the past. So thank you all for your time. Have a good night.